Good afternoon, brothers and sisters, friends. Welcome to this video. I did want to share this message. Uh, the Lord laid it on my heart, and I hope it will be an encouragement to you. I did want to mention first things first. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware that Israel um, is in war at this time. They were invaded from Gaza by Hamas. And also there's been rockets fired from the northern front from Hezbollah. So this might develop into the Gog and Magog war. We'll just watch to see. Uh, pray for all uh, the people of Israel for their safety. Um, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, as the Bible says. And also, too, um, Jesus is coming soon. Uh, he could come at any moment. I want to share this word with you today. Um, Luke chapter 18, verse 1 through 8. If you have your Bible, I'm going to read that. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with him? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. I'd like to title this, When Jesus Returns, Will He Find Faith? You know, faith is something a lot of people say that they have. A lot of people claim to have great faith. A lot of people have... Um, some different ideas about what they think faith is or what it's not. But what does the Bible say about faith? What is this kind of faith that Jesus is saying that when he returns, will he find faith on the earth? Well, I want to know what that faith is that he's talking about so that when he returns, that I might be accounted worthy, that I might be found in Christ, not having another type of faith. You know, a lot of people think that faith is just something that you bring a supplication to God and, and you're praying for God to do something. And if if it doesn't happen, well, then some people say, well, you just didn't have faith. You didn't, you didn't believe enough. That's why it didn't happen. A lot of people want to obligate God to be able to carry out what they want. But we cannot obligate God. God is God. We are not. Now, we can come according to his word, according to his promises, and believe him for what he said but at the end of the day, it, it all belongs with God. But when we read about faith, I, I believe a, a good picture is right here that Jesus clearly gives a, an illustration of an example of someone that had faith. And when he returns, is he going to find that type of faith? Now, with faith, the word, it comes from the word, the Greek word pistis, which it means it, there's a persuasion. It means that there's a, a moral conviction. You know, there's a lot of people today that, you know, they don't have much of a conviction about anything. They don't have a conviction that many things are even wrong. They don't have a conviction that God has given them that he's trying to make them more holy. Um, that's why you have a lot of foolishness out there. I remember sitting one time, I was at a, a Denny's and I overheard another table. And I remember I went, visited this church and there was a youth minister there talking uh, to someone else, and they were talking about um, why that Dr. Pepper and alcohol were basically the same thing, you know. They were trying to argue that caffeine and basically, uh, you know, alcohol, it's a drug, um, and so it's the same thing, and you should be able to do it. You know, my friends, that that's a conviction with nothing, you know. There's not a conviction that anything's wrong. That, that's That's going towards a reprobate mind, but what do people have a, a moral conviction about as you see the darkness going further and further in many of these churches and what they allow into that building is, is really a testament to what they've already allowed into their own lives. Because the Bible says our body is a temple of the Lord in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, the thing is, is when you talk about faith, it, it, it mentions a reliance upon Christ for salvation. You know, it's not just a, a profession, but are you really, really relying on him for everything? You know, a lot of people, they, they come to God and they just want God to do something for them. A lot of people have an idea that they say, well, 
you know, I re I'm relying on Christ to, to fix my marriage, or I'm relying on Christ to help me out of a financial burden, or I'm relying on Christ to save my loved one. And you know, when you see it so often, when, when things uh, don't always happen accordingly to what our desires are, that people, we say they lose faith. They just quit. They just let go and say, well, it didn't work out for me. God didn't do what I wanted. You know, and you see that they just went off. Did, did they have faith? What kind of faith was that? Were they really relying on Christ for salvation? Or were they just relying on Christ to do something for them? <clears throat> you see, I believe there's always this testimony that people carry out that they have a profession as long as maybe things are going in a convenient well way for them that it's they're going to continue to have a profession you know but inside there, there is still not a, an inner commitment to the things of God no matter what happens you know when the times of testing come are they going to be able to stand are they going to be able to continue to go on now when you also talk about that word faith it, it does also have a connection to another word which is uh, pitho and it means to convince by an argument of whether something be true or false. You know, you're, you're trying to convince someone. You think of like with a lawyer, when they're presenting evidence and they're trying to convince the jury of someone's guilt or innocence, they're, they're bringing these facts over here to come to a conclusion, either this person's guilty or they're innocent. And you know, with being a Christian, of having this kind of faith, really is coming down to is, is there any convincing from people out in the world that would say literally this person has enough evidence and facts here that they do look like they're Christ-like? Is there a constancy in that profession? It's not just something that they say on a Sunday that this is what I am, but going through the work week, well, then suddenly they, they become more loose. They become more of one of the guys or one of the girls, and things just kind of roll off the their shoulders as far as convictions and, and things about being separate from the world, where people uh, find it easy to be deceitful at work or maybe to cheat, uh, cheat on a test at school, whatever it is to try to, to gain their way uh, to make a better path. And then they just kind of uh, excuse it away that it's just human weakness and it's no big deal because they think everybody just has these small little flaws. No, sin is sin. And people will go to hell because they love sin. And we must repent of all sin. And we must have a faith that agrees to that, <clears throat> that people would see that we love God and that we depart from all iniquity. Now, the thing is, is with faith, we understand that even devils, the Bible said, possess um, some kind of belief in God. Now, the devils do believe in God. They do. They believe he exists. They know he exists because he cast them all out of heaven when they rebelled <clears throat> with Satan. Now, the thing is, is this belief that they have, is that going to save them? Is that going to put them within the pearly gates? The Bible says no. So a lot of people, they claim to say, I believe in God. You know, I went to church. I grew up in church. You know, I know Bible verses. You know, some people have told me quite frankly, I'm a pastor. I believe God, of course. Of course I'm good. But you know what? Is this belief <clears throat> accomplishing any type of change in their life? Is this belief that they possess actually uh, making them do something? You know, if you say you believe something and you don't do it, you don't believe it. Don't tell me for a second that you believe this is the best restaurant in town and you've never went there and you never want to go there. How can you say that with any kind of conviction, any kind of persuasion, and say truthfully that you know it's the best food when you've never, ever experienced that? Now, you know, people are speaking about Christ, saying how much they believe in Christ, but yet there's no constancy in that profession. They have never tasted and seen how good God is. They have never been born again, but yet they go to a church, yet they fulfill certain ministerial duties, yet they are. Um, teaching Sunday school classes, yet they are missionaries going to places. But I can tell you they don't have a living and abiding relationship with Jesus Christ of a belief that changes their life, that they are becoming more like Christ. And there is nothing of the fruit of salvation. And there is nothing of the breath of heaven, of the life of the spirit in their selves. And you know, there's nothing there that you would say, this person believes Christ. But you know, the Bible says in James 2.19, I believe is that there is one God, 
Thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. They believe and tremble because they know that judgment is certain for them. They will be cast into hell one day. But I can tell you a lot of people think just that they believe, that they agree in their mind, and somehow it can be separate from their actions. You know, just because you believe something in your head, just because you can go, say, to a class. I remember going to college, and a lot of the times, you know, if they did give you a review, you could just, you know, memorize stuff. Very little that happened. That was more in high school. You could memorize all the information and just be able to pull that back from memory and just fill out the Scantron, you know, put in the right bubble, A, B, C, whatever it was, and, you know, you could pass the test. And, you know, it didn't matter a week later if you remember the information. You know, you passed that test, you moved on. But, you know, a lot of people think it's that way with God, that you can just, you know, try to convince people, just study up information, try to pass it forth, uh, make people think that you really have something when you don't. And, you know, you pass the test just because you retain the knowledge of it. It doesn't matter. You made it to the next grade. You made it to through that next prerequisite. You know, you made it to that next um, class, you know, to go towards a degree. And people think that's all that being a Christian is. It's just, you know, you just being able to play the part and act it out or be able just to memorize a few things and be able to, to get through it. That people aren't going to scrutinize you. They're not going to interrogate you. You're not going to have any minister up there, pastor preaching and saying, do you really know if you're saved? He's not going to be preaching, you know, uh, any convictions or challenging you uh, to die to yourself and, you know, to separate from the world. He, he's not going to be meddling and, and, and poking through and trying to find any sin in your life, you know, but he's just going to basically say, you know what, do you agree with what I'm saying? And that's really what uh, most of the Christian churches come to. It's just, do you agree with what I'm saying? Do you believe this? Will you just repeat after me? Will you just agree to these certain tenets of the faith? And if you agree, it doesn't matter if there's no change in your heart. It doesn't matter if you're not having any fruit of righteousness. It doesn't matter if you're still going to the bar. It doesn't matter if you're still playing FanDuel or some other gambling sports game. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're, you know, still going dancing out, you know, a few nights a week. It doesn't matter, you know, if you drink some wine with your meal. It doesn't matter if you do these sins just because you believe you're going to be okay. That's false. You're not going to be okay. You're still living in sin. There's no change. I can tell you, if you have a gospel that doesn't change you, you didn't receive the real gospel. Jesus, when he comes in your life, he makes you new. I tell you, the old things passed away, and if you feel still comfortable doing the old things, then you don't have Christ. You have another spirit. My friends, as we focus on faith and what it means, before I get to this, um, these verses that I read just a little bit ago, um, I remember going to this church in Knoxville and I heard this woman say, she says, I'm about ready to lose faith. And she was broken. And, and, and I felt uh, compassion for her because when she was saying that I'm about ready to lose all faith, I'm about ready to give up. Uh, you know, God, I was praying for God to do something for me and it's just not happening. And I'm just about ready to throw in the towel. And, and she was is broken and, and nobody had anything to say. Everybody just kind of moved on. Now, that was the only service I've ever been to there. I don't know uh, if she ever comes there regularly. I don't know if she's said that before. And, and I don't know if maybe she was just looking for pity. I don't know because if it's a common occurrence and some people are always just kind of on the negative side, um, trying to uh, to put that out there. But I, I felt like it was genuine what she said. But she needed an answer from God. She needed the word of God. And she said she was praying for God to do something. And God hasn't done it for her. And that, there, therefore, she was just going to pull back and say, I quit. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's not faith. And if you're saying you're low on faith, well, I felt prompted. If, if God led me, if there was an opening, I would share something. Because the message, honestly, that the man preached had nothing to do with anything she was saying. It was as dry and dead um, as anything I've ever heard. It, it, it had no effect. It had no help. And, and it sounded like this woman was literally at a crossroads, and she needed to hear from God. We all need to hear from God, ladies and gentlemen. We need God to speak to us. We need God to confirm what he's speaking to us privately. We need to have our faith encouraged. But when she was saying, I'm praying for something and God's not doing it, therefore, I'm about ready to give up, that's, that's not where our eyes and our focus needs to be. Our focus needs to not be on the thing we're praying for. It needs to be on Christ, okay? We can keep praying for it. There's nothing wrong with that, but we don't give up as far as on the timing, 
And that goes right in line with what I'm about ready to talk about, about this widow woman that came to the judge repeatedly. Now, I felt prompted at the end, the pastor gave me the uh, ability to be able to, to share something, and I shared that verse. I said, now faith, the Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And if we all look and say in our lives and say, you know, has our faith been low? Has our faith been shaken? Has our faith, you know, felt like we're almost um, taken out? We're almost about ready to quit, about ready to take our last step. You're not alone if you felt that. You know, there are dark days. There are oppressive days. There are days where we do feel weary. And But you know what? Where does this faith come from? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to pray. We need to get a hold of God. We need to read his word and say his word out loud because that's where faith comes from. That's what I shared. And so that's what we need to do, ladies and gentlemen. We, we need to stay in the word of God. That's, that's where faith's going to come from. But also, too, it's, it's not just there. We also need to be people of prayer. Now, Hebrews eleven six 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And you must have the faith that Jesus is talking about. If we're going to please God, we must believe that he is, first off. Well, who is he? He is who he says he is. Now, how are you going to know who God is? You're going to know who he is by his word. Jesus Christ is the word. Amen? God is synonymous with with his word, okay? That's why the devil's main attack has been, of course, to try to confuse people. He's always been to ask questions from the beginning, hath God really said? And then we have all these different translations that are not the word of God. It's, it's corrupted. It's been changed. It's been twisted. A lot of people are out there pushing it out there like it's the word of God, like it's the same Jesus. It's not. I believe in the KJB version Bible for the English-speaking world. Now, there's other languages out there. They have a lot of other versions of, of, of the Bible, and uh, you know which one is true for, for other languages. I, I can't be the authority on that, but I believe by the Spirit, He'll lead you into truth that you can't accept all of them. And I believe for the KJV version Bible is a living Bible, uh, breathed by God, uh, inspired by God. And you see that a lot of people are, are trying to say that God is, is the same as all these other things, and that's what the devil wants to do is bring confusion and doubt and that you, you won't take the authority of Scripture. You'll just believe in private interpretations, and you'll believe um, in all these other ideas that it's, it's not certain or it's not absolute. That's what the devil wants, and the devil will take you out if he's able to. He'll be able to destroy your faith if it's not founded upon the infallible Word of God. Now, you must believe that he is. You must believe that certainly, because there's going to come times when you're going to say, you know what? This has been a heavy blow. This has been something, I don't know if I can get up from the ground from it, you know, but you do have to have this settled, I believe. And in my life, many times, I do go back to Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Do you believe God loves you? I do. I believe he loves me and I believe that he, he knows my name. And you know, if you love God, if you have that settled, all things are gonna to work together for your good. It may not seem good from the outside for the time being, but let me tell you, God knows what's best. Do you have that confidence that he's in control and that he's gonna do what's best? He's gonna work everything together for your good. Do you, do you believe that? First off, have that settled. You know, because when things happen that you don't like, when things happen unexpected or tragedies that none of us are exempt from, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna to hold to? Where's your anchor? Now, I'm going to tell you also, too, another scripture that always comes quickly to me is Jesus said that I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I can tell you, whatever you go through, he's going to go through with you. We're going to go through trials and tribulations and difficulties, you know, if you know God or you don't know God. But I sure don't want to try to go through them without God. But when you know that he holds your hand and you know that everything is for a purpose, whatever you come through, you know he's with you and you're going to make it through. You have to have that settled, ladies and gentlemen. You know, you have to hold on. Now also too, I wanna to tell you, you must believe that God is. When you come to him, he that cometh to him, that means that you have to present yourself to him. That means that you have to 
have a continual coming to him, that you have to seek him out. And if you do that, you also must believe that he is and that he's faithful, that he's going to help you, that he's going to meet the need, that he does have the ability. His arm is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. You know that he's able to lift you out of the pit. You know that he's able to open the door for you. You know that he's able to provide the need at the right time. It might be late. It might be at the last hour. It might be the fourth watch. But you know, you can count on God. You know, and even in our semi-failures, let me say that it might be a failure for a temporary point, but you know, God is also building you up maybe for something greater, or it's a failure that it's not a complete failure, but maybe it's to, to humble. You know, maybe there's things that happen and it's not the end of the world, but it's something that God is taking you on another step. We can trust him with everything, that you're never a failure if you trust God. No matter what the world says, if they call you a failure, so be it. But you know what? We're always successful if we trust God, no matter what the world defines. Now, I also want to share, too, it says that, that he's a rewarder than that diligently seek him. He's going to reward them. He does have a reward. As the Bible says, he's not going to give a stone to a, a child that, you know, asks for bread. You know, even men in the world that are fathers, they're not, they know not to give bad gifts, the Bible says, or, you know, give a, uh, a serpent instead of a fish. You know, you think that God knows what we need better than what we know ourselves? A lot of people are asking for a lot of things that are really curses and not blessings. If you're asking for something today that's not aligned with God's will, and it's going to take more of your time, it's going to take more of your affection away, and it's going to be an idol in your life, it's going to be something to distract you and, and cool your heart to God, why would God want to answer that? Why would God want you to, to be distracted and entangled and, and go away from him? <coughs> In that way, that you'd be drowning in destruction and perdition. God doesn't want to lose you. God wants to keep you. He wants to keep you close to him. But the Bible says that they that diligently seek him. You know, you can look at some of those false versions and they take that word diligently right out of their version. They don't want, it, they don't want that in there at all. You know, they just want it more casual. But I can tell you, you're not going to know God unless you diligently seek him. And that word diligent means that you're going to investigate something. That means that you're going to search out something. It also has the word that means to crave something. You know, what are you willing to do to, to be able to, to get something? Now, I can tell you, when you investigate something, if you know anything about investigative work, it's all about gathering facts. It's all about putting the puzzle pieces together about what happened, especially with the crime. It's about under understanding who's connected to who, you know, who... Who has uh, a relationship here? And what's the motive? And, and getting all these facts together to, to solve uh, what happened. I can tell you, you know, if you are seeking God, you're investigating God's word. You're looking through and, and you're connecting everything and, and you're seeing, you know, what happened. And you, the solution I can tell you today is Jesus Christ. You, if you understand and you're searching through the scriptures, it's all the truth. And it points to Jesus Christ. He is the answer today. If you diligently are craving and seeking after him, you know, you might be seeking for God to do something in your life. But more importantly, you need to seek him. You know, seek the, the giver. Don't just seek the gift, my friend. And also, too, when you talk about searching something out, you know, it, it's, it's something that you need to do consistently. You know, I, I have time every day. You know, at least, at least a, a few times a day, I try to set aside just to get alone with God but also too throughout the day to keep my mind stayed on God, to keep my heart fixed on God, that let him speak to me. And I just want to always instantly, you know, be attentive to, to listen, that he can uh, move me where he wants me to go. I don't want anything to clutter my, my ears. I don't want any outside voices. I don't want any, you know, things of the media, you know, shouting and crowding out his voice. You, you really have to be on guard, but you have to diligently seek him. I don't believe God's going to give anything to lazy people, undisciplined people. Um, that's one of the, the the biggest things that probably annoys me is, you know, is preachers that are lazy, you know, and also there's, there's a lot of preachers that, and I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm just saying there's a lot of preachers extremely overweight. Shouldn't be that way, ladies and gentlemen. We, we need to have discipline. We need to be able to control our appetite, but we need to be able to have this discipline too that we do fast. And, you know, we need to have this discipline where, you know, we are a testimony, you know, I heard a preacher say, he said, today we live in a society that we have a bunch of fat preachers, but thin theology. 
Well, that's the way it is, ladies and gentlemen. There's a lot of people. Unfortunately, you know, uh, even in the business world, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna be frank with you. You know, you know, we need we need to be presentable. You know, we we need to carry ourselves well. You know, but also too, you know, there needs to be discipline in the Christian life. Okay, now. A lot of people, I can tell you, I remember one church I went to, I'll share this with you, and you know, the pastor, he was he was very obese, okay? But you know, the sad thing was, is that was all that he did. That was his only job. It was his job. I wouldn't say a calling, but I can tell you this, is uh, he would always show up 30 minutes late to church, never prepared, never had anything. But lo and behold, I, we had a, a, uh, a meeting, a men's fellowship at a Shoney's, uh, breakfast place at nine o'clock in the morning. And I kid you not, he was there early. I was actually there five minutes late. But I'm telling you, you know, making time to, to, to get to the buffet on time rather than to church on time is, is a bad thing. But you know, the Bible does say that, that the uh, men's bellies would, would be their God. Basically, they would do everything according to what the craving of their belly was. But let me tell you, you know, we, we need to have this desire and craving for God, that we desire the things of God. We desire the peace of God. We desire the word of God. We, we desire to be holy vessels, not to bring any kind of reproach uh, by our lives. And I'll tell you another story, another pastor. I, I talked to a friend and he was telling me about this church and you know, the pastor was talking about uh, leaving his job he was at. He didn't want to be bivocational. And so what he, he was laboring in prayer about it. And then he ended up choosing to leave the job and, and and, and to this day, as far as I know, he only preaches one service a week. Can't preach on Sunday night. Uh, they don't even have a service on Wednesday. Uh, everybody just shares a Bible verse. And, you know, the man just sounds as lazy as anybody can be. I don't know, you know, anything else about, but just, you know, how are you doing that full time? How is that an obsession? How is that a passion? How is that a calling? You know, <laughs> It's just amazing to me to think about what people accept and what people compromise with and think it's okay. But my friends, I, I wanna share something before I get off going another direction. I do wanna share with you that we must diligently seek God. We must have this persistence. And I believe the story of this widow woman is a clear example and, and I'm gonna run through this. Lord willing, hopefully we can see what this faith that Jesus is talking about. Now, the first thing is that there is a story of a judge. He didn't fear God. He didn't fear man. You know, from the outside of this man, he you would not receive any just judgment. He was probably someone given to bribes. He's probably someone that only cared about his own agenda. And do we not see that kind of corruption today? You better believe it. We do see that. Um, but here is someone that we hear of a widow in that city. And you know, a widow, she didn't have much of any rights at all. Um, I can tell you most of the widows are very poor. Most of the widows, uh, you know, they had a lot of financial issues and they lived basically about the generosity of others to help them, to provide for them. And, you know, um, they did not live wealthy at all. Um, there's many accounts in the Bible about, you know, uh, a widow just throwing in two mites. That's all she had. It wasn't very much, but Jesus says, you know, I saw her. She gave all. She gave more than them all because she gave all that she had. All the rest gave out of their abundance. But this widow, she came here and, and she said, avenge me of mine adversary, okay? Now, who was this adversary? Who was this person that was causing her problems? Well, we know the story in Elisha. There was a widow woman that came to him and said, listen, I have a problem. They're about ready to take my two sons away. I have a debt to pay, you know, and... and you know, her husband was dead. She had no way to do it, but I can tell you she had a pot of oil. I'm not gonna go down that whole story, but you know, the Bible says that God provided. She was able to do something. She had to go borrow a bunch of vessels and you know, and pour out of that pot of oil. And God was able to provide the miracle to fill all these different vessels with oil that she could pay the debt. Because what was happening, I believe that adversary that was coming, I believe it's the world, was coming to take her sons away, take her family away. And God said, not, not right now. No, there's, there's a way out. There's a way of escape. I can tell you, you know, the world is coming for your children. The world is coming for your relatives. And you know what? You have a debt to pay. 
And I can tell you, if only you seek God and you believe God, God's going to provide the way out. Because if you don't seek God, the world is going to take your kids away. If you're not going to be consistent in your home, and you're not going to have that altar and pouring out that oil in your home, you're not going to have that life of the Spirit in your home. You know, don't worry about them not praying in the school. Worry about it at your home because that world is coming for your children. We know there's all kinds of technology out there. We know the devil is trying to, to point traps and snares and trying to, to steal them away. But you better have this kind of conviction to avenge of the adversary. You know, there's another story about an adversary, Hannah. You know, she was childless. There was um, another woman that was also a wife of uh, her husband. And uh, she had children. And every year, Hannah was very stricken with grief because, you know, she was always um, basically harassed by this other woman and saying, listen, you don't have any life. You're cursed. You don't have anything. You're not the favorite. But, you know, her husband still loved Hannah. But this adversary was always fighting against her, always giving her problems. But it came to the point where she did pour out her soul to the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and we know that God heard her prayer. It was persistence. It was something that she wanted to be avenged of this adversary. She didn't want this reproach anymore. And you know, this widow woman, she was tired of it. So much so that, you know, she wasn't getting the answer. The man, the judge, he was not going to hear it, didn't care, and he just pushed her away. How many times did that happen? I don't know. How many days did she come? I personally believe, I believe she came day and night. And I'm going to tell you why. We're going to read in a little bit. I believe she came day and night to this judge. You know, she set her clock, you know, morning. And then that afternoon, right before he went home, she was going to make her appearance. And she came there. And how many days he just sent her away and said, not going to do it. Not going to do it. Don't have time. Not, not worth it for me. I'm not going to bother with this. But he said this. Listen, he said, yet because this widow troubleth me. Trouble. That means that she is just always holding him near, just always just wearing him down, always in this place of just bothering him, you know, just to be a constant nuisance. And there was nothing said, nothing said that, you know what, don't ever see my face again. I've already talked to you yesterday. Don't keep coming back. He didn't discourage her. She had that ability and she had that right, according to the court's according to that society, to keep coming. And it was all up to her whether she was going to follow through with that. And she kept troubling him, and he had this discussion with himself. He's like, you know, this woman is really bothering me. She's really wearing me down. And her continual coming, which means that she was set to a definite point to keep coming. She had a specific goal. She had a definite place that she was going towards, and, you know, because she was continually coming, he, he was getting tired. He was getting very wore down. That word weary really comes from the sense of a boxer, you know, that is getting buffeted on the eye to the point that he is getting tired where he can't, you know, keep his hands up and he can't see who he's fighting. He's becoming uh, more disabled where he can't continue in this fight because it's just wearing him down. He's not down on the floor, but he's still just trying to, to, to keep going forward, he was at this point where he says, I'm tired. I'm going to avenge her. I'm going to give her what she wants because I'm tired of this day and night. I'm tired of her asking the same thing. It's easier for me just to fix this, just get this done. But listen to me. When the Lord said this, he said, the unjust judge say that, said, you know what? Even though he didn't fear God or man, he was still going to do it. And this is what God is saying to you and I and say, you know what? How much so the just judge? Why won't God avenge his elect? Why won't God, you know, help your cause? If you continually do like this widow woman and you see God will avenge his own elect, but it says this, which cry day and night unto him. I believe she was crying day and night. I believe she was persistent. She wasn't crying just once a week. She wasn't crying once every two weeks. You know, she wasn't crying once every three days. But there was something about this cry, and it was a help cry. It was an urgent cry. It was a pleading cry. And I don't believe that you get anywhere if you're not willing to do that kind of prayer. If you're not getting to that desperation, to that help. If you're not doing to that place that your heart is being poured out and crying out. I don't believe you're, you're doing anything to move 
the hand of God. I believe God is looking for something. He's looking for something in you and I in the meantime, before that prayer is answered, before that thing comes to pass. And you see, God is bearing along with them. He is, he, he's in this with you. He is helping you. He is with us always. You're not just going through this alone. He knows what's at stake. But you know, just the answer, avenging of the adversary or the help, you know, all these things God is taking care of. But let me tell you, he's also doing something in us. You see, and that's where God says to us, and he says, he says, God, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. He is going to, to meet the answer. He is going to take care of it. It's, in, it's gonna be in a certain space of time. It's marked. But I'm telling you, what are you gonna do in the meantime? How is your actions going to be as you are waiting? What is going to transpire as you are continually coming to God? You know, do you think that widow woman, she ever felt like maybe giving up? What's the use? Why should I keep going? I haven't got the right answer for weeks, months, years. Should I just let go and say, you know what? God doesn't hear me. Should I just let go? This is an unjust judge. He's not gonna do what I need. She knew that she had to do it. She knew that she had to, to follow through. She knew that there was a, there was a cause. There was a reason, and, and you know what? She had a conviction that this was worth fighting for. She had a conviction that this is worth bringing her petition. Even though she may have took insults, she may have took laughter, you know? She may have been pushed out of, of the courtroom, you know, in, in a very rude manner, but she's like, I'm going to keep coming because this is my duty. And I'm telling you today, if you're a Christian, God is trying to speak to you and I something that this is our duty. You know, we are not just here to come once in a while. We are here to keep coming and keep coming to God because we're not just coming because of something we're seeking, but we're coming to him because of who he is, ladies and gentlemen. It's because he's faithful and he is, and he is rewarded them that diligently seek him. You know, when he says, when Jesus returns, will he find this kind of faith on the earth? Not very many people have this kind of faith. And I want to question you, do you have this faith? Are you in connection like this widow woman? Are you going to quit? Are you going to say it's not enough? That's what it says in the Bible. It says, and he spake this parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to what? To pray and not to faint. I believe what God is telling us today is in this picture, we see an instance. We see uh, a illustration of prayer we see someone that is going to continue to pray and not be turned back. You know, your flesh does not feel like praying. Your flesh doesn't want to pray. There's times that you just feel like, you know, I, I, you just want to have a pity party, you know, and you don't feel maybe a spirit of prayer. You don't feel just the overflowing well of salvation. You don't, you know, we don't go by feelings. We go by faith, but it's at that time as we begin to pray and seek God, encourage ourselves. We set that set time every day you know, a couple times a day. We, we keep our mind and meditate on the word and read the word. We're making a choice despite the way that things look. And this is the element of faith of what we're talking about that he's saying that, you know, when he returns, that there's gonna be people that are fainting, people that are losing heart, people that are quitting, people that are giving up, you know, almost coming to the finish line. And you know what? that they've set their affections and their goal and their desires on things that are other than Christ and, and they're losing heart and about ready to just throw in the towel. And he's saying, is there people out there that are still praying? My friends, I can go in probably 99% of the churches. If I know a church around me that has a prayer meeting, I'll go to it. There is one church down the road. They actually do have a prayer meeting, very short prayer meeting, but many churches I know all around Nobody has a prayer meeting. Nobody wants to pray. Nobody wants to seek the face of God. Why is that? Why is that the prayer meeting the most unimportant thing in the church? Why is it not the most important meeting? I believe it's the most important meeting in any church, and most churches think it's, it's optional. Most people, they don't know how to pray. They think it's just before they lay down to sleep or before they say they're or before they eat their meal, that, that's, that's what prayer consists to them. Just bringing God a, you know, a bunch of supplications to rattle through in five minutes. Most people believe that's all there is to it. But when Jesus says, 
When he returns, is there going to be this kind of faith that people are praying people? A people that are consistently coming day and night? A people that are consistently pouring out their heart, crying out to God? A people that are consistently undeterred from going to the altar are continuing to seek God's face no matter if the answer to their prayers are answered at this time, but they're still holding on and still believing because they're not holding on for what God can give them. They're holding on to God. Blessed is that man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. He has to be our trust. He has to be our hope. He's everything. And if you have that kind of conviction, if you have that kind of faith that you are a praying person, you're not going to faint. Your leaf's not going to wither. You're not going to be fruitless. People might call you all kinds of things. They might call you unholy. They might call you, uh, you know, holier than thou or uh, legalistic or judgmental. I've heard it all. I've heard a lot of different things. But one thing is, is I want to be consistent and love God and spend time with God and hear from God. You know, regardless of the things that happen, if God never does another thing, I'm thankful to be saved. I'm thankful to know him. I hope today you have this kind of faith. And if you don't, today is a day to commit all to Jesus. Today is a day to surrender all. Today is a day to open up your heart to him. Spend time with him. Set times in the day. Don't let anything come between that time that is for you and the Lord. And when Jesus returns, he'll say, you know, to you and I, I'll say, that's the kind of faith that I was speaking about.